message. So there we go. This. <sighs> Do -do -do. Here, compiler, compiler, compiler. We're waiting. I understand variant. I want to also talk a bit about tuple. Tuple is more familiar to us generally because in object-oriented programming, the basic class or structure is a means to aggregate a number of data members together in a conjunctive way. So here I have a login structure that has a name and a password. That is what tu tuple models. It takes this list of types and it combines one value for each type in that type list. Variant has a related but distinct usage in that variant is a disjunction of that type list. So let's take a look what that looks like. Whereas our login message is that combination of name and password, our notion of a message in general is going to be either a login or a request or a logout message. In this instance, modeling the relationship between these three distinct types comes more natural in the form of that disjunction, that login or request or logout. Let's take a look at the usage. We're going to go back to a simpler definition of our message object. We're still going to have that login request logout uh, scenario, but we've gotten rid of the tuple and everything here. And I'm going to add on just there's some function to take a message and send it. We'll leave that empty for now. The list of types in variant is called their its alternatives. If the first alternative is default constructible, in this case login, and yes it is because it's just an empty plain structure, then variant itself is default constructible. If we get rid of that default constructor for login, then we see that our default constructor for our message is now removed. Taking advantage of this, we can actually write some nicely terse code. Here I'm writing a, an array of messages that is going to first have a login, then send a couple requests, and then a logout. Then I can just iterate over that array and send each message in turn. Notice that the send function is not itself templated. Even though it can take in either a login or a request or a logout, and that the and these structures are distinct and unrelated, because they are tied together through variant, it can just take that variant of the three, and thus take any one that we need. Then what might that send function look like if we wanted to fill it out? The preferred way to get the value back out of your variant is to use this visitation function, this visitor function. This visitation function is going to take uh, two parameters. One, the object that is going to have all of the callbacks, uh, one for each type that in the variant. And the second parameter is the variant itself. So in this case, what I'm doing here is creating this object called overloaded, which is going to take any number of callable objects and it's going to aggregate them together in such a way that it has the function call operator corresponding to each of these signatures. So it's going to have a function call operator for taking login, a function call operator for taking a request, and a function call operator for taking a logout. So don't worry too much about what this syntax all is. Uh, you can actually find this up on cppreference.com. That's actually where I grabbed this from. And it is pretty handy. So the reason this visit method exists is because the variant itself is storing a discriminator internally, which tells it what member, what type is currently active in its memory. See, the variant is going to have a chunk of memory internal to it that is at least as big enough for the largest object that it may hold. What I just did here is added in sizes to force my login, request, and logout structures to be particular sizes. So login will be 4 bytes, request will be 12, and logout will be 32 bytes. 
we can see that the size of our variant in this case is 33. That would be the 32 plus one byte for the discriminator to tell me which my active member is. If I change this 32 to 16, we see that our uh, assertion fails. If I change that down to 17, we see it's compiling again. So we can verify that the size of the variant changes with the size of the alternatives to be a function of the largest of the alternatives. So what's happening is we have this discriminator internally, we have this chunk of memory. Only one of these types is going to be active at any time. Since the variant is the owner of the information of which is active, it is the variant's responsibility to tell me which one is active. Thus, I give the variant some callable object that is going to have a different overload for each type and I will get my call back for that type. Let's give this a shot for ourselves. I put together this example to start with. We are creating a vector of our variants. Our variant type is going to be a variant of int and string. I'm creating one variant from int, one variant from string. The syntax here uses the new C++17 feature class template argument deduction. So we're going to create one variant from an int and one variant from a string. We're going to iterate through all of our variants and visit each one in turn and pass that off to this overloaded construct which will have one overload for int, one overload for string. It will be called back for whatever is stored in each v. For int we should see it print int as int, and for the string we should see it print as string. Just a quick note here, I'm using GCC 7.1 through a Docker container. Builds, we run it, we get 10 as int and 10 as string. Let's verify that by adding in some more complexity. We should see 10 print as an int, 11 print as a int, 12 which is a floating point character here, also print as an int, 13 should print as a string, 14 should print as a string. Here we're taking it as an alternative byte string, here we're taking it as a std string explicitly. And we see everything as expected there. Here we should see the 12.5 actually gets printed as 12, just to double check. And sure enough, it does. Just to double check here, let's look at what would happen if we had omitted one of the overloads for the alternatives. And we get a compiler error. Yeesh. That's, that's an interesting error message. No known conversion for argument one from std variant alternative t of zero which that means that's our uh, first alternative which is ah right there also known as int to string so there we go there's your hint as to what's wrong this my recommendation make sure you got all your alternatives listed out there nicely in your overload set so you don't get this error message to begin with variant has some related types that are worth discussing conceptually the optional type is really just a variant of the type that the optional would hold or some none type. In this instance your type is either going to be holding a valid value or nothing at all. Now the actual C++17 optional is far more complicated than that because when you reduce it down to just this case you can give it a slightly better interface which the C++17 optional has but conceptually they are related. Another more complicated type that you might consider using is the notion of some expected value. We don't have this yet in C++17, but the idea is that you have either that type or some exception or error message or something given back to you. This, uh, in this case, when you get go to get your value out of your expected, you're either going to get that nice 
clean value, or you're going to have a call back with an exception given to you, which you can then rethrow at that point. And this one is a little bit more of a stretch, but I wanted to mention it just because conceptually and any object is really just a variant whose set of alternatives has been sort of taken to um, this set of all types. So just like variant, any is going to only ever hold one value within it and it's going to be type safe just like variant except with any you don't have to specify a list of types that it will hold. Additionally as food for thought I wanted to point out that there are some types that you use commonly within C++ that themselves are sort of implicitly variants, it's just they're built into the language, such as double. So if you think about the way double works, you either have some valid floating point number, or you have nan, or you have inf. That is variant-like that you're used to using is the pointer object. You either have a valid pointer object or this non-pointer type called null pointer. C++ we reserve the pointer to zero to represent the bad state, uh, which means that we have to make this check all over our code to make sure that the pointer that we're given is not a null pointer. Uh, if we had kind of rethought that usage as a variant, you could write your code to have valid pointers where you don't have to do that check up front or have your null pointer where as soon as you know that you've gotten the pointer you've um, you've already had your null pointer case handled and then the rest of the code down the line doesn't have to worry about that. An instance of variant is comparable if all of the alternatives are comparable with that particular operator. So let's take a look at some examples here. I have four different types of variants here, one taking int and double, one taking double and int, one taking int and non-comparable. The non-comparable class here just has no uh, comparison operators of any sort. One taking int and equality comparable. The equality comparable structure is only defined for equality comparison. We notice that we can easily compare for equality or less than for the two that have those relational operators fully defined on them. But we cannot compare between two different orderings, even if they have the same alternatives. If they're not in the same order, then they're not the same class. We can't com cannot compare between them. If the structures don't have the particular relational operators that you're trying to use in your variant, then the relational operators will not be available for that particular variant and it only needs to be that way for one of them. So all of the alternatives must have that relational operator defined in order for us to use it with the variant. We can see that we can do equality comparison for the variant that has the equality comparable structure even though it doesn't have the other relational operators. But since EQ comparable does not have the less than operator defined for it, neither does the variant for it. Added on the uh, less than operator here to our equality comparable, which is now inappropriately named. And we can see that our less than operator works here now. As a note, you do not get the same sort of behavior that you do with using std less for the comparisons with variant. It actually requires the operators to be defined for all the underlying types in the type list uh, for all the alternatives. Even though I have less than operator, I don't get the greater than operator like I can from std less. Likewise, I don't get not equals derived from equivalence operator. So just something to note there. These use cases are nice and all, but I'm kind of wondering what would Machiavelli do if he had his hands on variant? No, you cannot have void as one of the arguments in your type list. Yes, you may have the same type duplicated within your type list. And you can even work with it, sort of. You can't initialize the int because it's ambiguous as to which one is trying to initialize. But you can initialize the string just fine because that is unambiguous. It's pretty forgiving about the sorts of types that you give to it. Here we have one that has no default constructor. You can still use it so long as we initialize it using a copy constructor. In this instance, I've gotten rid of all my move and copy constructors. 
but I do have an explicit constructor from int. Notice that I cannot create my variant from this obnoxious type because underneath it is doing an is going to be trying to do an implicit conversion from int to obnoxious. If I eliminate that explicit portion, we'll find out that this will work. Variant is intended to have a never empty guarantee. I say intended specifically here because there is an instance where you can still get a valueless variant, and that is if an exception is thrown during a type changing assignment. So what we have here is a structure that on conversion to int is going to throw and we are going to try and so we're going to initialize a variant with a float to begin with. We are then going to try and put an integer into it from that throwing class. We are then going to try and put an integer into it from an instance of this throwing class. We are going to catch said exception. And at this point, our variant has already destroyed and gotten rid of its float. And the attempt to assign a new value into it has failed. And now we should see that we get this valueless by exception case. So let's build that and run it and yes we get our exception which I spelled wrong and it is truly exceptional this is not something that you're ex you're intended to be coding against in general the usage of variant is intended to have a never empty guarantee on it although you should be aware that it is never truly never empty guaranteed thanks for watching I hope you enjoyed the video if anything wasn't clear or you would like to hear about another topic in the future, please let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to hear more.